Hey, good morning, everybody. If you would, take out your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 17. Um, that's page 11 in most of your pew Bibles. That's Genesis 17, and we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 8. So Genesis 17, verses 1 through 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Lord, we're thankful that your word is full of so many promises. That you promise to be God for us. That you promise to comfort us when comfort eludes us. That you will give us peace in the midst of our confusion and misunderstanding. That when we're overwhelmed and surrounded by an enemy too great to conquer, that you have promised to fight for us. That when we need wisdom, you've promised to give it when we ask for it. So many promises in your word that comfort us, God. So we thank you that you are a God who makes promises and that you are a God who keeps his promises. And I pray today as we come to your word, no matter where we are in our lives, in our walk, in our relationship with you, with other people, that you would, you would meet us here and help us to stand fast on the promises that you've made, that you purchased for us by the blood of Jesus. Be with me as I preach, God, to, to rest in these promises and not on my own effort. I pray for those who hear that you would use your promise to awaken great faith, which results in worship, which results in greater faith. We love you. We thank you for Jesus Christ. And we pray this prayer in his most blessed name. Amen. So one of the most important things that I can uh, say to believing parents, so if you have a child and you're a believer, is that God has made you promises in Jesus Christ. That's one of the most important things I can say to a parent. God has made you promises in Jesus Christ. And I don't think the church says that enough. I don't think the church realizes it. That God has made promise is to the parents of children. And one of the reasons I don't think the church believes it is because the church is far too <laughs> eager to take the spiritual responsibility of the children away from their parents. If the church realized that God makes promises to the parents of children, the church would not be so eager to take the kids away and the parents were probably less eager to ship the kids off because God made those promises to their parents. Faithful children are brought up, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. And so if you have a child or you're thinking about having a child, I want you to really rejoice in the fact that God is not silent regarding our children. It's not one of those, here you go, children are a heritage from the Lord. Children are the many arrows in the quiver of a warrior. Hope they turn out all right. <laughs> That's not the way God does it. He didn't say, here you go, best of luck to you. He makes promises that are yours when they're received by faith. And you can depend on God to keep his word regarding your little ones. And if you're thinking, well, I don't have a kid, so this doesn't really apply to me. Actually, it does. Because all we have in this life are promises. I mean, that's it. 
That is it. All that we have, no matter where we are in life, single, married, divorced, remarried, barren, in the womb, fruitful of the womb, no matter where we are, all we have are promises. I mean, in a world that only guarantees failure, I mean, the only promise in this life is death, God enters it in the person of Jesus Christ and speaks promises. And before he enters it in the person of Jesus Christ, he spoke promises. And then he seals those promises with a no. So if you're, you're facing the prospect of being alone, like how, how will I live alone? I don't have a wife. What if I want a wife? God gives you a promise. Hebrews 13 verse 5. I will never leave you or forsake you. If you're facing the prospect of barrenness or perpetual singleness, God gives you a promise. Isaiah 56 verse 5, I will give within my house and my walls the childless, the single person, a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. Isaiah 56 verse 5. If you're facing the prospect of condemnation and guilt, he says in Romans 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're faced with the prospect of wondering whether or not you're going to finish in the faith, he tells us in Philippians 1 verse 6, God who began a work in you will complete it on the day of Jesus Christ. If you're facing the prospect of whether or not is God going to forgive me? Can he forgive somebody right, like me? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse chapter 1 and verse 9. If you're facing the prospect of rejection, will God receive someone like me? Jesus says in John chapter 6 verse 37, All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. No rejects here. That's a promise. And when you're faced with a prospect of death, Jesus says in John 11, 25 and 26, whoever believes in me, though he dies, he will live. And whoever believes in me will never die. That's a promise. Christianity is a religion for the dying man. That's what all of this life is. All of this life is a stripping away piece by piece of all the things that promise to give us and to bring us joy. God strips them away, one at a time, in a way that we can handle it, so that when he takes them away, we come to the realization that the thing that promised us joy, that we thought we absolutely needed for joy, was lying to us all along, And the promise that God made to us for everlasting joy in Jesus Christ is the only thing on which we can depend. That's what happens. The body that used to give us so much pleasure becomes the instrument of terrible pain. And you're left. Taking your last breaths, realizing That all you ever had, all you ever had, from the moment you were born to the moment you die, is a promise. That's it. That's all you possess is a promise. Everything else is a mirage. It's not real. And if you are in Christ before you draw your last breath, you will know that all you have is Christ. You will know this if you are in Christ before you go. And he'll prove himself faithful. So this this relates to you. No matter where you are. If you have kids, this relates to you. All you have is a promise. That's it. That's the only thing on which you can put any hope. Stock markets rise and fall. Spouses leave. People disappoint. God's word remains true forever and ever. All we have are promises. We're going to talk about how we relate to those next week. But if you have a child, you may be wondering, when has God made me a promise? And I think the only way to understand this is to work backwards, all right? So what I'm going to say is that God made you a promise in Genesis 17. He made you, if you are a new covenant Christian with a child, he made you a promise in Genesis 17. Now, how do you know that that promise is 
for you or to you? Well, that's why we're going to go to Galatians 3 and then work our way back. So Galatians 3, 28 and 29, Paul says this. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. If you're a Christian, right, we think about faith in Christ as how we become in Christ, and that's true. But faith in Christ is also, in a really mysterious way, how we become in Abraham. And the reason it's important to be in Abraham is because all the promises that God made to Abraham, he is still fulfilling. And if you are in Abraham by faith, as Paul says, you're Abraham's offspring and you're heirs according to that promise. In other words, in other words that promise is now your promise. That's what it means to be an heir. That's what it means to be the offspring of Abraham. He goes on in chapter 4, verse 7. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Galatians 4, verse 28. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. And so Paul's laboring to, for us to see the connection. You may not know... Your genealogy. Not all of us are as privileged as Daniel Smith. Who knows that his family came over on the Mayflower. And in so doing, they set the, the, the captain's lodge on fire. It was one of the first people executed in the States. Not everyone has a grand heritage like Daniel Smith. You don't even have, you don't even have to know your heritage in Christ to know that you have one. You have a history. You don't need Ancestry.com to tell you where you came from. You don't need it. You have one. And not only do you have a history, you have a family, you're part of a long line of people to whom God has made precious promises. It doesn't matter how messed up your family is. It, that, it doesn't matter. That's not what's, why it's by earthly pedigree. You have the history. Paul picks this up in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Therefore remember, this is before you were called into Christ Jesus, that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, aliens, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise. Before you're in Christ Jesus, you were a stranger to the covenant of promise that God made to Abraham. You're a stranger to it. Having no hope and without God in the world. So that's what we are before Christ. You are strangers to the covenants of promise. What covenant of promise? The one he made back in Genesis 12. And in Genesis 14. And in Genesis 17. That one. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. In Christ Jesus, you're no longer a stranger to that covenant of promise. You're an heir to it. That's why I can stand up here and tell you all the promises of God that apply to every one of your life situations. Because all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Paul looks at all these promises that God has made, and then he looks at the person of Jesus Christ and he said, I know God keeps his promise. There's his yes to him. All of those things that I said earlier are ours in Christ Jesus. Just like the promises that God made to Abraham. So Abraham, what God promises to Abraham, we are not strangers to. We are not alienated from. Rather, 
We are heirs to the very things that God promised Abraham. And God is fulfilling that promise to Abraham on our behalf in the person of Jesus Christ right now. Every single day. He's making good on his word. So Abraham then is a paradigmatic example for the Christian in that our lives resemble his. God made us a promise and we'll either believe it or we won't. So, what exactly did God promise Abraham? Well, if you kept your finger in Genesis 17, that's great. It'd be easy to turn back to. Genesis 17, 1 through 8, he was 99 years old, all right, when God appeared to Abram. He was 75 years old when he was called the first time. So 14 years, God says, I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to have offspring. That's what he heard when he was 75. Now he's 99 and he didn't have it. So Genesis 17 The Lord God appeared to him and said to him, I'm God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be God to you and to your offspring. After you, and I will give to you and to your offspring. You see that you see what's happening here. He's taking this covenant with Abraham and he's applying it to Abraham's offspring. This is not just something that's going to benefit Abraham. God has Abraham's children in mind when he makes this covenant with Abraham. He had your, if your parents were faithful Christians, he had your parents in mind when he made this covenant with Abraham. If you're a new covenant member in Christ Jesus, he had you in mind when he made this covenant to Abraham and this promise to Abraham. I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And here's the main part of the promise. And I will be their God. I'll be God to you, Abraham, and I will be God to your children. This is repeated all through Genesis. It's picked up in Ezekiel chapter 37, same same language, verses 24 through 27. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my prince, shall be, David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will set them in their land and multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place shall be with them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. He makes this covenant to to Abraham, his children, his children's children. What God is promising Abraham is faithful offspring. Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 37 through 40. So to go backwards a little bit, Jeremiah 32, 37 through 40. If I were polite, I would have, you know, I would have done Jeremiah first, but I'm not. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them out of my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place and I will make them dwell in safety. Now, notice the repetition here. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. 
And whenever that language occurs in the Bible, something is right behind it or before it, always. Look what's right behind it in this case. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. That to those who are faithful to God's covenant, he makes a promise to them regarding their offspring. And we don't talk about it. We act like it's not there, which explains why we behave the way we do. And with that in your mind, you know, you go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, really beloved, quoted passage in some circles. It should be loved in all because it's God's word. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for this promise is for you and for your children. And for all whom the Lord our God will call to himself. You know, and you think, why does he bring up their kids there? Because it's in line with what the entire Bible says about the kids of the faithful. That's why. It's just natural. It seems weird to us, but it's natural to them. So God promises parents of the new covenant godly offspring. Now the question is, how will he do it? You know, is it just one of those... Ta-da! You know, you go and live like hell all week and your children look like heaven. That's not the way it happens, folks. It's just not. We're told how it's going to happen in Genesis 18, right? So Genesis 17, he makes the promise to Abraham. In Genesis 18, this is what he says. So God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their sin against him, their iniquity. And God says, shall I hide from Abraham? This is Genesis 18, 17. What I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and that all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So that, there's a purpose clause, the Lord may bring to Abraham what he promised to him. You see what's happening here? God promises Abraham Great things. And not only does he promise Abraham great things, he promises them to his offspring. Well, how will God fulfill this promise that he's made to Abraham, to Abraham's offspring? God answers the question by saying, well, I've chosen him for this purpose, that he would command his children and his household to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. It is this act. That's what the so that means. It is in this way that I will bring to Abraham what I promised to him. So that's how God does it. He gives offspring to new covenant members of the body of Christ in Their performance of righteousness and justice and the command to keep the way of the Lord is is what God uses to bring about the godly offspring. Godly offspring would come from a family, teaching a family. So you get to Deuteronomy. Just turn over to Deuteronomy, right? Chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. Let's start at verse 9. It says, only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. How on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord God said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on earth. And that... They may teach their children so. 
This is amazing. You know, God's about to descend on this mountain. And fi- it's about to look like Mount Doom in the Lord of the Rings. Fire, smoke, trembling. He's going to leave an impression on these people. And before God does it, what's in his mind is, I'm going to relate to them this way so that they will make it known to their children and their children's children. I'm going to speak to them that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven. Just you, the, Picture that. If you're an artist, picture that. How would you draw that? The mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven. That's massive. Wrapped in darkness, cloud and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form and there was only a voice. All of this happened so that the people would teach their children and their children's children. All this happened with the children in God's mind. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It's the greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them. When you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So immediately after the most, one of the most important commands in the Bible, a verse so significant that adherents of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all point to his significance. Immediately after this verse, they are told, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 through 21. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children. Talking of them when you are sitting in your house, when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. And so there's the model. This is how God is going to ensure godly offspring. He gives their parents great and precious promises to believe and to act on. And when Christ comes and dies, and we see the establishment of the church, it's not because God has abandoned his original plan. So before he sends John the Baptist to prepare the way, we read in Malachi, Right, chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. I'm going to send them Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. <laughs> How are you going to prepare the way for the Lord? Well, I'm going to try to fix this family stuff here. We're going to get the children and the fathers relating to one another. That's the way it was supposed to be. Acts 2, we've already talked about that, verses 38 and 39, right? And then you have all the household baptism in the book of Acts, you know. They were baptized. The people were converted and were baptized, they and their entire household. Acts chapter 16, verse 15, we wouldn't talk about Cornelius, but Acts 16, verse 15, Lydia, right? 
After she was baptized and her whole household as well, she urged us saying, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. Acts chapter 16, verses 32 through 33. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house as the Philippian jailer. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Chapter 18, in verse 8. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And the many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And then Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, right? Fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so you see how this moves through the whole scope of redemptive history. That God is gathering people into covenant relationship to keep his promises to them. One of the ways he does it is by the public declaration of the word of God, is what you see in the book of Acts, right? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. They believed, and God added to their number those who were being saved. But one of the most often overlooked means in which God is building his kingdom is through faithful parents teaching their children. And the children coming to saving faith that way. God did not abandon his plan the household plan to bring good on members of the new covenant's children. He didn't abandon it. We did. We abandoned it for programs, for revivals, for Sunday school, for Bible colleges, for Bible schools. We've abandoned all the promises that God made to us as parents is what he will do for our children and for us if we're faithful to him. And we just pushed our kids somewhere else and said, well, this is how I'm going to do it. They hear Bible all day long. Dusty teaches them all day long about the Bible. I don't, I don't need to tell them about it. That's why I'm sending them to the Bible school. That's why I'm sending them to Lindsay Lane. And all the while at home, we're a bunch of hypocrites We say we love the Lord with our mouths. Our hearts are far from Him. And the children see right through it. They see right through it. God hasn't abandoned this model. We have. Which is why the church celebrates testimonies that look like Rahab's. So much so that if you have grown up in a godly home, and you don't have this awesome testimony story about, you know, being almost dead in a ditch somewhere and God coming to you, you envy it. You say, I wish my testimony was like theirs. Why? It's just as miraculous that God gave you believing parents and made them promises and kept his promises to them for you to be saved as it is for him to rescue somebody from a ditch. It's just as amazing. And the church is wishing everybody looked like Rahab. And you got some story. If you're in Christ Jesus, everybody has some story. You got some kind of story. Whether it's generational faith. Fullness resulting in salvation or generational faithfulness resulting in salvation despite the generational unfaithfulness. It's some kind of story either way. God has been kind to you either way. Instead of us celebrating the kind of testimonies that testify to the fact that generational unfaithfulness abounds, the church should mourn that we haven't had more of an impact on the faithfulness of any given generation. Why does it have to be this way? Why does God keep having to rescue somebody's kids from a ditch or from drugs? 
or from addiction. When he's made promises to the parents that, hey, I can show my power a different way if you'll believe what I say and act on it. Now, let's end on a word of hope. Because to some people, you know exactly what what is on people's minds. It seems like God's promises has failed for some of you. That hadn't been your story. Hadn't been a lot of people's stories. I think that's what the Bible teaches, though. But that's what faith does. It takes truth that doesn't correspond to reality, and it holds it up as truth, and it says, okay, I have to choose to believe this, even though I'm 99 years old and Sarah's 90, and God's promised me an offspring. My body is as good as dead, Jack. But I will make love to her. Listen on a word of hope. And that's what the whole sermon is. Next week, it's, all, it's about, it's a word of hope. Okay? What do you do when God's promises seem in jeopardy? Do you question the one that made the promise? Do you undercut the promise that's been made so it doesn't look like that's the promise? So here, here are three things. Number one, God's promise is rooted in his praise. And I get that from Psalm 102 in verse 28, right? Where he tells us, Psalm 102 in verse 28, that... I've written down the wrong verse. This is not the right verse. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. All right, Jeremiah. The question is, is can you find the one that you should have written down correctly on the fly? We're going to try this. Yes. I, yes, I found it. I only wrote down the... The number incorrectly. It's, it's Psalm 102, 18. Let this be recorded for a generation to come so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. I mean, that's, that's why God does everything that he does is for his praise. And so if you are in a situation where it does not look like your offspring is going to make it, They came out of the womb rebellious. You have passages like Isaiah 48, verses 8 through 11. Where he says concerning Israel, I knew that you would surely deal deal treacherously and that from before birth you were called a rebel. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you. That I'm, I may not cut you off. Behold, I've refined you, but not as silver. I've tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, says the Lord, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to one another. God continuously defers his anger for the sake of his praise. And the promise of godly offspring is rooted in his praise, which gives us a great hope that although our reality doesn't necessarily correspond to God's promise right now, that's why the sun rose on Athens, Alabama today. For his name's sake, he did not cut us off. He deferred his anger for the praise of his name. Here's the second word of hope the promise that God made to Abraham he is still fulfilling he fulfilled it in Acts 2 38 when people believed the gospel he fulfilled it when Lydia was converted and her whole household was saved God is still keeping his promise to Abraham when Presley came to saving faith he was keeping his promise to Abraham Every time you see someone come to the Lord, he's keeping his promise to Abraham. There is not a day that passes where God is not keeping his promise. Not a day. And here's the third word of hope. 
He purchased this with his with the blood of his son. I mean, Jesus is our great hope. All the promises of God find their yes in the person of Jesus Christ. There is not a thing that God promised to Abraham that Christ did not purchase. It's not a thing that God promised to you that Christ did not purchase and ultimately fulfill with his blood. So what do you do? When it seems as if God's promises have failed. What did Abraham do, right? Romans 4, 17 through 21. I've made you the father of many nations, Abraham. (laughs) And he hadn't. When that verse was written. He hadn't even given him one son. Paul adds his commentary here. In the presence of the God in whom he believed. We're going to spend some time here next week, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it now. But who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that don't exist. That's who we're dealing with here. It just seems too hard for him to keep his promise. You're dealing with somebody that calls life, that gives life to the dead. And speaks into existence things that do not exist. Like he did existence at one point. Exists existence. In hope, he believed against hope. That he should become the father of many nations. As he'd been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. That's what it's natural, right? You look at God's promise and you consider all the things that are opposed to it. So God's promised you a child and you're 90. You know, and the first thing you do is you, you know, you just look down. You know. He didn't consider his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100. And if you can finally get over that, right, then you got to look at Sarah. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. There's all kinds of evidence that this is a lie. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. So what do you do when the promise seems in doubt? Abraham shows us. You worship. That's what it means when it says Abraham grew strong in his faith when he glorified God. He worshiped. And when he worshipped, it strengthened that faith. So it's this cycle. Consider, faith falls. Worship, faith rises. How and why? Well, put simply, worship considers not the deadness of your body or the deadness of your child or the unresponsiveness of your child, but it considers God. That's what worship does. It takes the consideration of all the things that exalt themselves against God's promises and it looks at God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that don't exist. And when one considers God, praise happens. And as you consider God and His absolute omnipotence, Faith begins to rise. Because what's, what, do, what do you lack? What's lacking in your marriage? What's not existing in your marriage? Well, when you come in the presence of God, it's such a silly question. He calls into existence the things that don't exist. Your mind doesn't even exist right now. So what? You're dealing with somebody that says exist and it does. What's dead in your life that needs resurrecting? It's just dead. You ever heard anybody say that? It's just dead. I feel dead. My affections are dead. So what? He gives life to the dead. And when you consider all the promises that God has made in His unfathomable power and ability to do what he says, you no longer feel the need to attack 
the promise, whether or not it's legitimate, or to reason it away in your mind, you just worship. And as you worship, faith rises. And as faith rises, you worship more because you're considering the thing that builds faith. And so if, if you feel like it's all lost this morning, here's my plea. Is that you would not consider your situation, but you would consider the one who brings all situations into existence and gives life to the dead and worship him. Because the greatest promise that he made and kept is that of Jesus Christ, who came, who's born under the law, bore our curse, and gave his life as a ransom for many. Dead because of our sin, raised for our justification. In proof that every promise God makes is a promise that he keeps. Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his love. Pray for help today as we look at this word and as we consider it, that you would give us grace. You would help our hearts. And that we would receive this as your word. And we would not look at what exalts itself against you, but we would look at the only one who deserves exaltation. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, I pray for those who are not believers, that they would place their faith in him. That they would repent of their sins. That would give them up. That you would graciously draw them to yourself. And give them the great end to which all your promises attend. Oneness, union with a person of Jesus Christ. We love you. We thank you for him. We pray for grace now. In Jesus' name, amen.